Welcome, welcome to, to this room. Professor Ondimu will be our chair. And welcome. 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 welcome all of you to this session. My name is Professor Ondimu, Department of Geography at the University. I'll be chairing this session and um, assisted the rapporteur is Professor Wikista Muturi, Dean Faculty of Environment and Resource Development at the University. So we want to start, but first maybe I want to know whether each one of the presenters is ready. We have Mutunga. Are you ready? Yes, I am. Thank you. Then we have Chiptanui. Not Chiptanui, but Avoga. Is Avoga with us? Yes, I'm ready. Thank you. Then we have Obura. Is Obura around? We have Koske. E.K. Mutua. And heads. Yes, so the rules are that we we'll give presenters 10 minutes to share with us their findings. You share with us your paper, maybe give us the objectives and findings. Don't take so long. And then we shall have two minutes of question and answer. I would not like to interrupt your presentation. So I'd like you just to keep time, yeah? 10 minutes for each presenter, and then two, after the presentation, we shall allow two minutes for questions and answers. If you feel that you, are, you have more questions, then we encourage you to write them down and then we shall capture them and forward to the secretary. Yeah? Is there anybody with any issue that you'd like to ask before we start? Silence means there's no question. So may I welcome Daniel Mutunga to make his presentation on poverty eradication interventions in Kenya, a marriage or an achievable dream? I hope oh, we shall be able to answer that. Can I be that. allowed to, to share my screen, please? I would like to use my slides. It's OK. Yeah, allowed. So you have 10 minutes starting now. Well, I see you have my name is uh, Daniel Mutunga from Leicester University. And uh, my topic is as uh, indicated here. Uh, it's just a, um, a study that, I, that, I've, I've, that I've done, not really a research, trying to, to look at uh, how poverty and uh, environmental degradation influence each other to cause the kind of uh, issues that we have witnessed in our country. Uh, as we are aware, and the literature is very clear about this, studies have shown that uh, about half of our population is actually living, um, is poor, um, that they lack essential services like water and health. And uh, even 80% of the population in semi-arid regions um, comprised mainly women and children. 47% of them 80% uh, are living at the poverty and 47% of urban population also live in very squalid um, housing, which is characterized by abject poverty. But this is all despite the government intervention to, to reduce poverty with different approaches. Poverty as, as a problem, you know, has been a challenge since independence. And there's different efforts that have been made to, to reduce this, but it has remained persistent. Uh, what does it mean to us is mainly deprivation, meaning lack of resources, power, and, and voice, <clears throat> of 
opportunities and choices. But there are different factors that contribute to this. And, and I want just to, to mention a few. Um, for, for example, we have politics and the institution of factors that uh, contribute to the poverty that we have in our country. The, we have poor representation, especially by the leadership that is there, mainly represents its own interests. We have institutions that do not have the capacity to, to address poverty, to improve the well being of our people. Civil society organizations that would have helped in this, though they were very vibrant, they have um, uh, remained a bit silent. They are not as vibrant as they were. We also have socioeconomic factors that have greatly contributed to this. And a part of this is poor infrastructure that we experience in our country uh, that would have helped in you know, food production and marketing of the same. And again, lack of capacity by the institutions that should provide services or contribute to poverty. We have also, the poor cannot access credit. Um, or, and it's also very difficult to access uh, or get business. Um, I, there is also a cost of doing business in our country. Farming is also another problem uh, because the, the services that the farmers would like to get are not available as they should. There's also lack of poor access to services like health and education. Environmental factors have had their own toll also in, um, in, by contributing, in contrib contributing to poverty. For, in, for instance, we have um, uh, inadequate and poor enforcement laws that, laws that should uh, check um, and degradation or mismanagement of our natural resources are not effective as they should. Poor governance, again, weak institutional capacity, high population, industrialization and we are all craving and desiring to be fully industrialized by 2030, but it has its own effects uh, in contributing to, uh, I mean, to, to the environment. Again, urbanization, because um, uh, we, for instance, our cities have expanded and the areas where we had vegetation and improving our climate are already paved. Po poverty and the food insecurity, again, a major problem as, as the peasants um, and the rural people try to farm. They do a lot of damage to the environment by felling trees and cutting the vegetation that is there. Disasters like floods and the drought, we may not don't need to talk a lot about this. It's already being witnessed in different parts of the country. The point is all these factors mount pressure on the environment and the situation wasn't uh, due to lack of coping mechanisms by our people. Community conflicts, uh, a lot of this has been witnessed and uh, we already have some going on in Mandera. We all have those in some parts of Rift Valley even today especially among farmers and pastoralists because of scarce resources by pasture. Among pastoralists themselves because of lack of water and also due to political inst instigations, all this. And uh, the bottom line is that even with these conflicts, with displacement, uh, it, poverty is aggravated, not to mention the environment itself. What has been the government intervention uh, strategies to stem poverty and this would even go far back as um, the colonial time when we, the colonialists also tried to, to stem this, although for their own interests, so we could go back to what was being referred to as the Swinaton plan, which although it meant uh, to, in some way to improve the well being of the people, it is still, it was more in favor of the Europeans or the colonists than the local person. But it generally failed to achieve the intended goal because the, 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 the people, communities were not involved in it. Subsequent interventions, uh, like um, if we started with the Canon Manifesto, which was there immediately after independence, um, it was it aimed as, um, at um, an, an enhance economic growth and to ensure that there's just distribution of natural national income among individuals and in different regions of the country in the different regions of the country but it ended up the elites took over this process and they as, as we have said when it comes uh, comes to leadership 
they serve, they go and continue to serve their own interests than the interests of the people they would be representing. We have a different paper, session of paper number one of 1965. Um, it, it aimed at um, improving again the well being of, of the rule of, of, the Ken of Kenyans, and especially what they promoted, the African socialism. Critics of this have argued that there was nothing social, socialist or anything to help that would have helped the people. Instead, it, it was there just to diffuse their ideological differences that existed between the, the different leaders that we had then who were different inclinations when it came to economic development. We have our diff, uh, diff development plans, uh, basic needs approaches of the 1970s intended to again formulate policy to improve the well being of the especially rural people. It didn't manage. We had the rural sorry, the district focus for rural development in 1983, which intended to, which was actually rural focused, it intended to uh, decentralize um, the resources uh, that were there. But again, in the end, it was politicized, especially when the district committees involved politicians and um, the, the, the people at the grassroots uh, were not given the opportunity to, to, to present their views, not to mention it was more of programs, but not the people themselves who were to ben benefit from it. We have also had economic management for renewed growth in 1986. It was to review the economic stagnation, but- um, I didn't move fast because, because you're almost finishing your time. It now caused untold suffering to the people. Um, we, again, poverty strat strategy paper of the 2000 to 2003, but all of them, they lack community involvement and also fail to address environmental issues. Now, poverty environment relationship or nexus, it's, there are hidden costs to this. For instance, we, we have embarked a lot in um, industry and economic development. We talk of construction industry, for instance, what do they embark on? Peace and farming for subsistence. Clearing of land, they, they are involved in clearing of land and farming methods for, you know, to farm and the farming methods that they use, sand harvesting and the making of charcoal, livestock grazing, which is really of a grazing the land, um, industrialization and the management of waste, corruption, for example, in the management of natural resources, that is, for example, our forests, pollution of water bodies and its effects to human life, Poor management of waste is all what we are witnessing today. Then the question is, how does the government uh, and the development agencies factor all these effects in their poverty intervention strategies? That question remains unanswered today. What conclusions do we make out of this? Uh, one, the poor are major stakeholders in the poverty reduction endeavor. In other words, we can always, we can string, strongly say nothing about them or nothing about as if we were to speak on their behalf without them and without them or without the poor in our planning we fail development is also about people and not programs so the only thing that can succeed is only talk of people centered development a good example i wish we could know what is happening in a place called yata where um, a, a church leader embarked on working with the poor, the poorest of the poor, they were tra trekking 20 kilometers to fetch water. Today, um, they can't get relief food because they have forgotten it. They, in terms of food security, they are good. If we, assessed, if we assessed how much our economic growth costs the environment, we may come up with surprising figures. But my question is, I'm not an economist, but how much does our economic growth cost the environment? Community livelihoods, that is means of livelihoods cannot be ignored in our development plans. And finally, we, the, um, I wish to just suggest the following. Fact, we need to factor uh, the people in our intervention strategies. They know their needs better than us. Okay, factor in envir environment care of an environmental uh, protection in all our development plans. If we ignore this, we are doing it at our own peril. We need to de design strategies that involve all stakeholders in the war against poverty and environmental degradation. And finally, we need to create awareness on the relationship between human life and the environment. One of the things that has so been announced in the environmental degradation is 
the fact that we have not related ourselves to the environment. Thank you very much. Thank you for that presentation. I would like to request that if you have any question that you cannot be allowed now to post because of time, kindly post it under the chat and then it will be addressed later. We can even forward that to the presenter. Let me start off by asking one question to the presenter. What poverty indicators were you considering, especially when you are measuring, when you say that there has been no change? My second say that again. the indicators, what are, yeah. what are the key indicators you are using to measure trends to see whether there have been changes or not? My second question is, yeah. at what level did you measure this poverty? Is it at the household level, community level? And is it the same for the entire country or there are some areas that we have met some strengths? I wish you could okay. highlight on that, yeah? Thank you, thank you. Any other? Oh, I thank do you. that. No, we As have I say, Is there any question again from any? You can read the one in the chat. Okay, I, as, as I said from that's, the beginning. That's all done. Okay, thank you. The, the other question is, is it environmental degradation that leads to poverty or is it poverty that leads to environmental degradation? Okay. Which one leads to the other? Maybe you can respond to those three. If I start with the last one, it, it remains a dilemma to date about uh, poverty and, uh, and that's why I talked of poverty uh, environmental degradation nexus. It's almost like chicken egg relationship. Today, um, if you go to not only to some rural areas, but even urban areas, um, look at the economic activities uh, for livelihood that people are carrying out today. A lot of what they do, especially in food production, they, because of um, late poor rainfall, they keep expanding their farms. For what reason? To produce more. But as they expand, one, poor methods of farming, which re lead to erosion and uh, land um, pollution, the, the cutting of veg vegetation cover and the trees um, to expand these farms. What do they do? Uh, a lot of land is exposed to erosion causing um, um, er, um, more degradation. Now, as they do that, the degradation increases uh, their poverty in the sense that the very soil, the little humans that, if I get talk to that as an example, the little humans that are remained of the, of the soil is carried out by, by uh, water and erosion because of more exposure to land. So that remains still a very intricate relationship and a factor that we may want to understand what is the start, where do we begin to address it? So it is, it, it goes back and forth. And that, that's my explanation. As for the first two questions, I said, I mainly relied on, on literature, what other researchers have, have said. I, I, I may not have had any indicators, however, uh, if you look at the increase today, we are two, three months ago, we are talking about 2.8 million people who need relief food. Um, within a very short time, the number has risen to 3.1. Just look at the statistics that even media, that it, how it reports to us, that in this given year, for example, two, three, five years ago, we are talking about just a million people who needed relief food. That number has never gone down at any one time. What do we, how do we explain that? The, I may not have hard data that I have collected to prove what I'm trying to, my, my claim, let me put it that way. However, information that is there, even from the media and hard data, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mutunga, for that presentation. And I would like you to 
maybe take those comments and others that will come after that so that you thank you and reach your paper thank you now let's go to the next presenter t aboga you could uh, start now and then you have 10 minutes you're starting at 2 26 pm okay Thank you, and kindly allow me to share my screen. Yes, yes please. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. We can. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, um, Tabitha, I've been working on uh, assessing the level of acceptance of off-season diversified vertical vegetable garden through secondary school-based approach to agricultural extension. I'm an MEC student at Tigerton and I've been guided through by Dr. Mbati, Professor Monga, and Dr. Lida Awaso. As I begin, vegetable, the world produces enough vegetables to feed about 8 billion people. The volumes produced are not uh, enough to supply adequate vegetables recommended for consumption. In Kenya, for example, in Kenya, the Western region, the, uh, focusing on the Western region, the Western region, the Western region of Kenya, vegetable production and consumption is significantly low, and this can be attributed to factors of limited production and the seasonality of uh, production. Hence, there is a need to improve vegetable production. Increase in production requires sustainable use of technologies. While sustainable use of these technologies are largely dependent on the level of acceptance at some level or by farmers. Currently, there are several technologies under vegetable production that have been developed, such as kitchen garden, vertical farming, greenhouses, the analog uh, open field method, hydroponics. However, their adoption or level of acceptance is still low. Agricultural extension is mandated to increase information dissemination to farmers with an aim of improving production. From several approaches that have been used by agricultural extension, field demonstration has proved to be effective. However, due to limited resources, the approach has faced several hurdles and uh, it cannot uh, establish numerous sites where farmers can easily access information for learning. This has reduced the rate at which farmers access the information. Besides, Technology, sustainable technologies under vegetable production are not viable via public field demo plots. This is, this is also coupled by extension challenges like understaffing and limited funding of extension activities. Hence, I need to devise new strategies that will improve vegetable production. While focusing on new strategies to enhance sustainability, youth engagement is key. However, there are very few instances where youth have been used in vegetable production. According to, according to Development Local Extension Capacity, DLEC in Rwanda, youth can play an important role in agriculture development as well as advisory services. However, such programs have not been fully employed. For uh, another example is the 4-H clubs. The Forest Club is the USA that adopted the positive youth development approach. The other societies assisted the, or undoubtedly improved the vegetable production at the turn of 20th century in USA. And it, it made it possible to reach out to the laggards, whom the public extension officers had found it difficult to convince them on production technology. In Kenya, some approaches similar to 4 have been use such as the 4K clubs and the young farmers clubs, the young farmers club. The 4K clubs were established in or established before 1990s, but in early 1990s, the club died and uh, it failed to have impact in the farming community. In last year, Mr. President relaunched the club, but to date they have not been affected. The young farmers club were established, but mainly focused on promoting the psychomotor skills of students and it failed to have a link between students in school and farmers for wider knowledge dissemination. Approaches such as the 4K uh, class. Is, uh, is yes. it possible to move with the slides because we are not seeing we, how you are moving? I'm on the third slide. 
Yeah, think. maybe so that is a problem. We are not sharing the slides, they are just appearing there and static. Oh, she can put but it on from my end, they're point. moving. Okay. From my end, they're moving. Oh, no, they're moving. Continue? Yeah. Okay. It's not, uh, it's not okay. Huh? It's okay. Okay, sir. It's okay. Thank you. And um, I was talking of uh, the approaches such as the 4K, the 4H, and uh, the the 4K, 4H, and the Young Farmers Lab can be used to be to disseminate information and be an alternative to vegetable production challenges through extension. However, in Kenya, this is an approach that has been ignored. And with the current challenges facing inflation, you can be an alternative approach to agricultural you need, extension. Excuse me, Thabita, you need to put them on slide presentation mode so that you can move with the slides, yeah? And then you start from the where you are, the current slide is fixed, something like that. Yeah? It's okay. Okay, so. Therefore, through participatory approach on vertical gardening, the study aims to assess how students in school can be used as, as an alternative extension approach to promote vegetable production in the western region in the western kenya or in western counties of kenya the purpose of the study was to assess how schools can be used in promoting vegetables using the vertical gardening technologies and it was guided by three research questions to assess the status and use of vertical garden to to assess the readiness of relevant institutions since the study aimed at, at engaging youth in school and allow them to promote the technologies to the community. And third, how the approach could be uh, deploy, uh, deployed so that it can improve vegetable production and be an alternative extension approach. On methodology, the study was carried out in Tesla South South County, Busia County. The area exhibited both social, economic, and environmental uh, conditions that necessitated for an, an alternative vegetable production technique coupled with extension challenges that are faced by the area. The research adopted a mixed research design using quantitative and qualitative approaches. Quantitative approach, you, qualitative approach use, adopted the use of action research, focus group discussion, observation, and semi-structured interviews, while the quantitative approach ado adopted the use of survey. Sampling was done, and the study adopted proposed samples to select the four day secondary schools. The day secondary schools were suitable for the study as the study aimed at engaging students and allow them to transfer the information. So in day school, the students were able to transfer the information within a very short period of time. And also the farmers were given time to even inquire more about the project within the life of the project. The target population was uh, students, teachers, farmers, and agriculture extension officers in the area. The target population of students was equivalent to the target population of farmers. And that is one student selected for the study, automatically selected a farmer or a parent for the study. From the accessible population, 131 students, 131 farmers, six extension officers, and four teachers were selected to be part, to participate in the study. On the instrumentation, the study adopted, used uh, collected data for both qualitative and quantitative using questionnaires, observation guide, focus group, discussion guide, semi-structured interview guide. Data was collected on two phases. One, the first phase collected the baseline survey that informed on the gap, that informed on the gap and a suitable intervention, while the endline survey was collected on closure surveys to identify the outcome. Both quantitative and qualitative approaches had equal dominance. And data analysis, the key indicators were derived from the three research questions. One was the status and use of vertical garden. Can you kind of go to your results and uh, because you are almost through with your time, please, yeah? Okay. Uh -huh. The data analysis was done using STSS and inferential analysis, especially the Will Coxon signed drunk test. Preliminary analysis were conducted to understand the gap and suitable intervention. Closer surveys were done to evaluate the outcome. Under the data section, the gap identified under production was less use of sustainable vegetable production technologies that were weather dependent. So a suitable intervention was to increase access on knowledge and skills on alternative vegetable production technologies. 
Understanding the use of vertical garden include the gap was minimal use of empty spaces and hands-on education, educational opportunities. The intervention was to engage students in a participatory training to enhance skills and knowledge acquisition. On uh, extension services uh, for vegetable production, the results showed that there were minimal extension services on vegetable production. The public extension focused on county pilot project and county pilot projects activities. So the intervention was to provide a, recommend, a suitable policy that will guide increased services on vegetable production. While assessing the readiness of schools, the schools had uh, the gap was uh, less awareness of extension services and no active young farmers club to serve as entry point for extension officers. Therefore, there was an opportunity that existed that the school shared a fair relationship with the extension or the community that the relationship allowed for an interaction between the community and the extension officer. Under the readiness of farmers, the farmers didn't have any knowledge on existing opportunities that they could learn from school farms. And neither were they referred to school farms to learn. Therefore, creating awareness on learning opportunities was a, was a suitable intervention. While assessing the readiness of extension officers, there was minimal extension officers, uh, extension services through schools. So providing a suitable policy was an, was an alternative. Providing a suitable policy was, a, was, a, was deemed as a suitable intervention in this uh, on this variable. Of, after analyzing the baseline survey, the study implemented the intervention. And the first intervention was to form the, four, the young farmers clubs because there was no young farmers club and engage students on participatory training on the DVVGs. DVVGs stands for Diversified Vertical Vegetable Gardens. Why DVVGs? Because from the finding, baseline findings, Vegetable diversity was low in the area, as well as production technologies were weather dependent. So the study used weather independent technologies to promote vegetables. The training was done on th three th vertical gardens technologies, second wall, primary tower, and mound bed. Second wall adopted the second wall and primary tower adopted the gunny bug technology, while mound bed adopted the permaculture technology. On Habita, vegetable we, diversity. Habita, we give you one minute to okay. summarize, please. Yeah. On uh, vegetable diversity, black nightshade, kale, spinach, carrots, and capsicum were used. Coriander, onions, and marigolds were biological pest control. From the outcome, 14% of the respondents are appreciated the DVVGs. This was one week after the intervention. However, vegetable diversity was still low. While comparing a uh, field demonstration approach, there was no significant difference in level of technology acceptance between the public field demonstration and the school field demonstration. Hence, the, the approach to school was viable. But the, the practicality of this approach depended on a suitable policy, access to technology, knowledge brokerage, and technologies that capture students' interest. interest. From the approach, dissemination of information on DVVGs through school had a positive impact and, and increased vegetable production. Therefore, using a suitable policy, extension to school can be a potential strategy for promoting agricultural technology as youth can be both recipients and providers of extension and also be an alternative extension approach. Thank you. These are the images of how it was done, preliminary training, then participatory training, then the demo side, the demo plot in school outcome. Then thank finally- you, thank, thank you, Thabita, thank you so much. I know you have a lot of work to share with us, but maybe time will not allow. So we will still read your presentation when it comes to people want to, to understand what your findings were about. Yeah? Maybe let me welcome a few questions, one or two from the, the audience. There is one from uh, Alfaya Kosgei. He's asking, Tabitha, what do you mean by the method depends on brokerage? What do I mean by? The no, method no, depends no. on brokerage. You must have talked no. about that. Knowledge brokerage. OK. Knowledge yeah. brokerage is simply simplifying a technology into, a, into ways that can be easily understood. So in this approach, knowledge brokerage it will be through participatory to, make, to ensure that students really understand what you are doing. 
My question maybe to you is that you are looking at factors that influence levels of acceptance. If I had to ask you to give me the, the major ones, if you rank, what were the major factors that influence levels of acceptance? No, they were not really factors, but from the heading, I think while I was sharing the slides, the initial abstract, there was a problem. From the beginning, I'm assessing the level of acceptance of off-season. Okay. Yeah, not the factors. But I'm, I'm asking whether the, you can yeah. be able to do that, because the title is levels of I mean, factors influencing, but are you able also to include factors that influence different levels of acceptance? Yeah. I can, I can, but the focus for this presentation was under assessing the level of off season. So the title is erroneous. Yeah. The, title we have, the title we have here is erroneous. Yeah. It was uh, quite changed. Okay, okay. okay. Thanks, yeah. thanks. Any other question? Sawa, so, thanks Tabitha for that wonderful presentation. Thank you. Yeah, I wish you luck in the devising and maybe if there's any other questions that we have for you, we shall send it to you directly. Now let's have the next presenter, E. Ogura, direct use of ecosystem services by rural households, a case study of Sagla Park in Homer Bay County. Yeah, so thank you very much. My name is Dr. Ogura, yes, and I will be presenting on uh, the topic which have been mentioned. Yes, please. So I will share a screen um, which will guide the presentation up to the end. I will be very brief. So I think you can be able to see the screen that I've shared. And I hope I'm loud enough for everybody to hear me. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Dr. Sari. Yes, welcome to my presentation. Um, so we're presenting on direct use of ecosystem services by rural households. And we are, our reference is uh, Sagla Parks in Homer Bay County, Kenya. My name is Dr. Obura, and uh, we published this paper together with uh, Maurice. I'm from the Department of Biological Sciences, Egerton University. And uh, Maurice is from the Department of Natural Resources, Egerton University as well. So on my introduction, uh, I will, I've explained that Sagala Parks are actually savanna biomes, which have been invaded by sisal plant, uh, Agave sisalana, peri. So when sisal invade savannas, they convert them from ordinary savannas into unique ecosystems called Sagala Parks. They were discovered in uh, Homer Bay County in 2015 at uh, the locations projected, but now they are widespread through adoption by pastoralists or through adoption by farmers. Now, the main economic activity at the park is uh, Saiso Acacia Grass and Livestock Agrotourism, which is where the name Sagla comes from. Up to today, since 2017, we have never quantified the direct, direct use benefits of these parks. And uh, that has hindered the expansion of, of these great parks to help the rural communities. So the photograph you see in front of you are uh, images of Sagla parks. That's how they look like. So these are actually savanna grasslands. You know, savanna is a true canopy vegetation structure where you have grass and then you have acacia trees. So it's a true canopy vegetation system. But if you have a, a third crop introduced, a third vegetation introduced called sisal, it converts the ecosystem from uh, ordinary savanna into a Sagla park. And the images in front of you there are actually illustrations of how these parks look like. Now, the objective of our study was to enlighten stakeholders by explaining the direct use of Sagla parks and spur adoption or scale up of these ecosystems. Under specific objectives, we determined the direct use values and we determined the link between household wealth status, gender, and direct use of ecosystem services of these great ecosystems. We, our methodology was very simple. We used uh, random sampling, simple random sampling to select households 
we surveyed 60 households living around the parks and we used the questionnaires as the main instruments for data collection. Now the results are displayed there. We were able to extract about eight uh, direct use uh, factors. So we were able to, we realized that livestock grazing, size of craftsmanship, fieldwood collection, charcoal burning, beekeeping, gum collection, size of poles harvesting and touching grass harvesting were the main uh, direct use benefits derived from these parks, where livestock grazing was the dominant activity at the park at 93% of the respondents uh, uh, responded that they use the park for livestock grazing. 64% of the respondents uh, uh, said that they use it for size of craftsmanship. 87% of the respondents extracted fuel wood from the park. 13% of the respondents were burning charcoal. Beekeeping accounted for 6% of the respondents using the park. Gum collection was 3%. Only 3% actually reported that they are harvesting gum from the park. Size of poles harvesting, up to 72 respondents uh, said that they harvest size of poles from the park. And 28% of the respondents argued that they harvest touching grass from the park. Uh, when we calculated the mean annual direct use value of the system services from the park, we found that it is about 39,590 uh, shillings per household per year, which is about 4,215 shillings per person per year benefit from the park. Now, women respondents dominated size of craftsmanship at 95%, fuel extraction at 91%, while males uh, dominated grazing, charcoal burning, beekeeping, harvesting sizal poles, and touching grass harvesting. Our conclusion is, these results indicate that rural households rely heavily on existing services from Sagla parks, and there's gender disparity in the extraction of the existing resources. And these findings uh, will guide scientists, community developers, and policymakers in the context of uh, poverty alleviation and sustainable rural development and most importantly, the expansion of these parks across uh, Kenyan savannas and across African savannas. This inquiry, uh, this study was, was supported by IFS grant number D stroke 5446-1. So my presentation is actually very short and very simple because it was only 15 minutes and I wanted to exhaust every corner of the presentation. So thank you very much and God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Ali, for that presentation. I didn't have to remind you of time because you have kept your time. I have two questions for you. One, yes, you have talked about assessing direct use of ecosystem services, and you listed some of those uses. Yeah. My question is, how sustainable are those direct uses? As an environmentalist, did you also assess? to see whether the users have knowledge on conservation. Yeah, maybe the, maybe yeah. we can also highlight on those two. Yeah, yeah I, will, I will highlight on the sustainability. Yes. Issue. Yeah, if you compare Sagla parks uh, and uh, normal ordinary savanna grasslands yes. before invention by Saiso plant, you know, Sagla parks are more resilient to human and climate pressure uh, compared to uh, barren savannas. So them being more resilient to human and climate pressure make them more sustainable um, than ordinary savanna grassland before the invasion. So that resilience aspect actually uh, brings the sustainability of these parks. But uh, with, our, with, with, with the rural consumption of ecosystem resources, um, there need to be education, eh? education on how to sustainably exploit uh, the ecosystem services, existing good and services availed by the, the parks. So sustainability will come also with the education of the community on how to best use the park. And also sustainability comes from the resilience, the high resilience of, of, of these ecosystems compared to ordinary grasslands. Thank you. Yeah, you, the second question I was asking whether you assess the levels of awareness amongst the users. We, we, we didn't, uh, we were limited by funding. Okay. Uh, 
so we we did not uh, assess that aspect of awareness. We were we were looking at um, direct use values uh, of ecosystem goods and services from the parks. I, I wish you could also recommend that because since you have said that there are gender differences in direct use, yes. somebody could be interested to see how those other socioeconomic factors affect yes, yes. awareness and also conservation measures. There's another question here. Somebody is asking, yes. what problem were you addressing by this research? The other question is, you talked about charcoal burning. Is there any replacement of trees which is being burned for charcoal? Yeah, those are some of the questions you may wish to respond to. Yeah, the first one is about uh, the, 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 the problem which the study was addressing. Eh? And the problem was, uh, there was a gap. And that gap in knowledge has actually hindered the stakeholders' knowledge and support and expansion of these parks. And the gap was, the stakeholders actually do not, did not know to what extent uh, is this ecosystem um, important to the rural communities? So that uh, knowledge gap is what we are filling in this study to inform the stakeholders across the board on uh, the, the, the net economic direct use benefits of these ecosystems to the rural households. So there was a gap we were filling. And the, the second charcoal burning, uh, we realized that uh, one of the activities one of the ways through which the community use the park is through charcoal burning. And of course that relies on whether the trees are there or not. So the, the, the process, well, the trees, the tree, the major tree cover at Sagala Park is acacia. Um, so you realize that the main economic activity the community use acacia for is uh, charcoal burning, but that depends on the availability of this resource at the park. Um, so in cases where we have- uh, thanks, that... thanks for that. May we allow two other participants to ask a question, Professor Maranga and uh, Alfaya Koske, that order. Professor Maranga, please. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Bura. I, I realize uh, that uh, uh, this was not an e ecological study, but you seem to be invoking some um, very exciting uh, principles and mechanisms that relate to ecological succession. Now, I'm actually wondering in my mind, are you seeing here from your explanation, uh, an introduced species is being part of an ecological system where we still do not understand uh, the uh, dynamics in terms of uh, either competition or sharing of resources uh, in this uh, new system, which is an element of ecological succession. Uh, there was one question you were asked about uh, what you think in terms of the resilience of the system and the sustainability of uh, uh, this particular ecosystem uh, in view of uh, continuous supply of goods and services. Uh, perhaps my question now relates to uh, what you thinking is in the future. Uh, do you think that with this kind of innovation, innovation and, and or probably uh, with the introduction of um, a few other species, this system would still remain resilient. Yeah, so thank you very much, Prof, for that. Yeah, we, in fact, there's a study we are currently doing, which is uh, we are trying to establish what actually maintain the ecosystem. And we realize that uh, the harvesting, the harvesting of, of, of the trees actually encourage the growth, reduce, eases competition for grasses and siso. So it is actually the human interference uh, at the ecosystem. We are establishing that currently with the current study that is the human interference at the park like grazing, which allow the ecological, which allows the ecosystem to, to remain the way it is. Where for example, harvesting of, of, of acacia actually reduces competition for 
sisal and grass allowing them to grow. So we are currently studying actually weak dynamics uh, actually maintain the ecosystem the way it is. And one of them, actually, one of the factors which will maintain this ecosystem is the other term, anthropogenic interference. Um, the cutting of sisal actually uh, allow grasses to grow. So when the community harvest sisal, sisal uh, the grasses will get opportunity to grow. And when, when, when a case is removed, um, uh, it allows the, 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 the crops in the lower canopy to thrive. And also, if we are also studying the soil, because the roots of these uh, vegetation, you realize that acacia is actually a deep rooted plant. So there's that aspect of resource partitioning where actually grasses will exploit resources at the surface. Sisal will exploit resources just below the, we build the grass roots layer, and then acacia will exploit deeper resources in the soil. So those dynamics, uh, the ecological dynamics, we, we are studying, we are, there's a study going on actually funded by IFS where we will actually establish which, which which factors actually maintain uh, sagla parks the way they are uh, without one vegetation overrunning other vegetation out competing others or which which factors prevent ecological establishment of a climax community um so that study is undergoing i think uh, we will Sorry, let's, let's allow alfaya Bosque to ask his question and then maybe we'll stop there yeah? yes, yes. Okay. Okay, okay. Thank you, Dr. Pura, for a very wonderful presentation. Uh, I have a very short question. Uh, when you mentioned that uh, the preparation of your uh, park is Sakla, but the, the last A there is agri agrotourism, which in your in the, the direct users, I don't see any anything about the agro or any tourism activity. Did, did you make any recommendation if there is no agrotourism or why why is it called agrotourism? And I didn't see anything about agrotourism. Um we are agro tourism. We were actually interviewing the local com the local people on how they use the park, and uh, uh, directly them themselves how they use the park. But uh, we have people coming from uh, outside the community who come for recreational facilities, but we didn't have interviewed those people. So actually. The local community, because of their, this park is always in their midst, so they don't use it much for tourism. But outside the community, outside the, our, our research area, the people, what we call Wagenis, they visit, they come and visit the park and see it. But that, that group of people, we, we didn't uh, interview them. Thank you. Then maybe kindly respond to the one, there's another question on the chat, chat wall. Yes. By Dr. Alcano Abdi Maybe yes. time respond to that. I can open my chat. Then you can respond with that. Yes, yes. So that we give the next presenter time to okay. start the presentation. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Our next presenter is. Oh, Dr. Dr. Pura, kindly stop sharing your slides. Oh, wow. So we may allow the next presenter to share his. Aye, thanks. So the next presenter is A. Koske. I don't know what A stands for. You tell us. Flood vulnerability and mapping in Tana River County, Kenya. OK, thank you so, so much. And uh, oh, the other A right. there stands for Alpayo Koske. So let me share my screen. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Kindly go into presentation mode so that we can follow your presentation. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Slide by slide. Thank Good. you. I thank you so much and uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to my presentation. My name is Alfaya Boske, and uh, my co authors of this research was Professor Atanape in uh, Hokkaido University, Japan, uh, Dr. Makanji from uh, Natural Resources in Igaton University, and Dr. Choja Shamata from UNESCO. The research we carried out was on flood vulnerability and risk mapping in Tana River County, Kenya, using the multi criteria decision approach and the GIS. So, to introduce my presentation, uh, uh, this research was about the flood uh, 
phenomena mapping using the GIS tool. So uh, from the picture there, we can see the situation of the flood situation in the year 2019. So uh, the, side. the floods are oh, sorry, over 170 million people annually across the world. And uh, in Kenya alone, the floods are affecting uh, over 800 people uh, within Kenya alone. So in the in the year 2019 alone, in the uh, during the short period of October to December, the short rains it displaced over 130 people. So this uh, means the flood situation is uh, really alarming and it needs a uh, forecast. So this digital elevation model here that uh, we drew was showing the areas in Kenya that uh, are at risk of uh, flood risk. So from the two pictures there, we extracted the, the map here and it is showing us the areas that are vulnerable to floods. And uh, those are some of those counties here includes the Tana River, Carissa, Wachir, Narok, Mandera, Turkana, Isholo, Samburu, Taita Tafeta, among many other uh, sub uh, counties in the lowland areas. So uh, the GIS and, and remote sensing technologies have made significant contribution in mapping of these uh, hazards, including the uh, floods, the landslides, the mudslides, and the rest. Uh, to better do these things, it is uh, the multi criteria evaluation uh, methodology is good. Well, many, many uh, criteria are combined together and they are factored in using the GIS environment so that we can easily depict the areas that are likely to get flooded for the purpose of developing things like uh, early warning system. So the objective of this research was uh, was to carry out vulnerability assessment and generate the flood vulnerability maps, particularly in the Tana River County. So this is a um, study area that we carried out our study. Uh, it was in Tana River, Kenya. Uh, that is the map of Tana River. Some of the socioeconomic activities here, we, we found out that most of the people who are living in this area are one of the poorest. People according to United Nations Development Program in 2015, and the area is generally dry and also prone to drought. The main economic activity here is uh, livestock keeping. So this is the map. Imagery. And, and we also collected the geological data using the soil. So this is the, the flowchart of the meteorology and we are, I'm going to summarize this flowchart in the next uh, presentation here. So uh, we actually made uh, the, 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 the data sets using seven, uh, actually eight uh, data sets. One of them is a sloping degrees. We use a uh, tool called a digital elevation model. The source of the data was a uh, JAXA uh, website. The distant rivers we use the Euclidean distant tool, and the land use land cover we um, uh, classified the lands at images using and surface classification in NP, and then the altitude we also use digital elevation model. Drain density we did we use what we call flow accumulation, uh, and and the direction line density, and we also collected soil using from our data set, rainfall using climate research units. Uh, the Sentinel map here, we were using to, to, to validate the, the validity of our maps. So the results are uh, shown here. The, fa the first factor is the soil here, which we can see here uh, that uh, one of the factors that influence the area vulnerability to flooding is the soil. So uh, we found out that the major the, the soil that covers most of the area in the study area is the, is the sandy loam soil, which is very vulnerable to flooding. And uh, the other one also that were also vulnerable to flooding is the uh, uh, soil of uh, hydrological group seven. We can see there it is the loam and the soil hydrological group number D, which was also uh, found out, which we were found out that it is also a factor in, in flooding. The second factor here was drainage density. So the drainage density, we, we made it using the flow accumulation. And the high values here shows the area is are uh, very vulnerable to, 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 to flooding. The other, ma the other factor was a rainfall map, which we made it here. You can see there, the, most of the lowland areas is receiving higher rainfall, and also the, the higher part at the middle, there is low uh, rainfall. The other factor, the fourth factor was elevation. So elevation, the, most of the area, the area is sloping generally from the north to the south. 
normally from where the, the, the river is coming from towards the coastal lowland. And then the other factor was distance to major rivers. Distance to major rivers is also one of the very important factor in contributing to the floods. Most of the areas that are close to, area, to the river are experiencing what we call the flood, flash floods. And then the, the other factor was slope increase, which we also have the map there. The higher the slope, the higher the speed of the water and also the, the less the, the, the flood event in that area. But in the lowland areas, they likely to get flooded. The last factor here was the land use land cover, which we, cl we classified here using the anthropic classification. And we found most of the area here is fair and, uh, and, uh, and it's used for agricultural uh, activities. The NDVI here, the normal the different natural vegetation index here, we were using to counter check uh, the validity of this map here. So most of the area here was covered, uh, the highest area it was covered by the rangeland, which is 49%, followed by the cropland, which is 30%. Uh, this is the what the, the AHP indicator that we were using to rank the, these uh, these these parameters, which we started. Where the, the 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 parameter that was having a lot of weight here was the elevation and the drainage density here, and, and also the the distance to major rivers. So this is the results. The map here that we depicted here shows that most of the lowland areas in Tana River here is the one is the most of the areas that are very susceptible to flooding and in terms of the land use land uses that six percent which is highly uh, within the moderate areas were in areas that were used for agriculture and uh, and the parent land and uh, the areas that are mainly affected by flooding is the region that have highlighted there which is which is in Carceno the, and Carcen uh, south this is the area that, uh, that we found out of high vulnerability. In terms of uh, analysis, we found out that uh, the area that were under uh, vulnerable region covered 20% of the area. And the model predicted that a total of two, over 217,000 hectares get in during the rainy season. Most of these areas are under the Garcenot, the Makindu, Jewani, and Kibini West, which are very highly vulnerable. This uh, study is supposed to find by other studies in the area that, that uses the water balance to predict this particular flooding event. Uh, in terms of land use land cover, uh, the land use land cover determines the flood affinity of the area. And, in, and uh, most of the area here that we said they were under high risk of flooding is, uh, is used for agriculture, which is shown in, that, in, the, in the above map there. And then the other factor here is the soil, which we said most of the area in the high susceptible areas are having soil that is sandy and clay loam, which is soil hydrological group 881 there and sandy loam with low balance densities. So the study uh, made some recommendation in terms of- You have one minute to summarize, please. Okay, uh, the methodology and the management significance. So we found that this methodology can contribute very value as a valuable tool to mitigating of the floods and developing of floods at an index. So uh, in terms of management, it can also be a very good show of the weakness in the flood defense system and pattern vulnerability. So uh, GIS and remote sensing can be integrated in early warning system. So to help in, uh, in it forecast in this particular event that reduce the damaging impacts of the floods. I uh, thank you so, so much. This study was funded by the UNESCO under uh, the Heiso Puchi Fund. It was uh, conducted in Hokkaido University in Japan. And we uh, we appreciate the the university got the university for hosting this conference and the supervisors Professor Tanabe and Dr. Makanji for the everything. I thank you so much and thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. The floor is open for questions and answers. Please let me have those ones who are have issues to be addressed by the presenter. Maybe let me start it off by asking you one question. In your assessment of vulnerability, yes. did you find out some households that were less vulnerable than the others within the study area? If so, what were the characteristics of those households, which were a bit okay. resilient? Okay. Uh... 
Thank you so much, uh, Prof. The method of uh, assessment we were using was uh, mainly the remote sensing and the GIS. So we did not make efforts to see the vulnerability. The, the in form of the vulnerability we assess in terms of the areas that are susceptible to most of these uh, flat uh, parameter, the criteria, the seven criteria. So the area that we found, they were uh, under these, most of these criteria, we, we classified as vulnerable, but not in terms of uh, households. Thank you. Yeah, we allow other questions from Professor Mugai and Professor Maranga, please, in that order. Maybe with your permission, Chairman, I can straight away uh, ask my question. Yes, please. Now, um, I'm kind of wonder wondering aloud because uh, I'm thinking that the use of uh, uh, special technologies, uh, impressing GIs and remote sensing, we should also be able to have an integrated system uh, that uh, can serve uh, in divining the specific risks, for example, to a flood events, uh, so that uh, you know uh, the activities, uh, human activities, are related to increasing the vulnerability of certain areas for flooding, can be minimized. And now I want to ask uh, Alfaya if he thinks that from where they are, uh, they can be able to move uh, to the next stage. Uh, so that uh, they can provide early warning signals that I have uh, some useful indices of uh, active risks involved. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor, for that question. Uh, for sure, that is a, a very true uh, reflection of it. Uh, in our recommendation, we found uh, that the early warning system mainly is, uh, is using the the water balance and, and the flow regimes in the in the discharge that they, they normally use. But if we can also integrate the the, the, the machine learning GIS and these remote sensing the methodologies to further predict and or provide a more holistic uh, a high warning system, I think it, 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 it can contribute a lot in terms of uh, minimizing the damaging effects. Because most of the social perspective, we normally experience the flooding and then uh, we now start evacuating people. But if we introduce these methodologies together with the water balance and the and the water forecast that we normally have, it can contribute much significantly to reduction of the damaging effects of the floods. Thank you. With that, I hope there's no any other question for Alfaio. Thank you for that presentation. Now you can exit that presentation mode so that we give room to the next presenter. Okay, thank you. Who is E.K. Mutua. Hello. You will kindly introduce yourself, yeah. Hello, can you see my uh, my screen, please? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you for this chance. Uh, I'm Elvis uh, Motua. My uh, my topic is the insecticide properties kind, of kindly go to, kindly go to presentation board just the same way the other other presenter did, yeah. Uh, can you see it now? Hello. Hello. 
Und der Mensch vergleicht Hallo. Hello. Hello. Yes. We are trying to guide you. Help. It's okay. You can't hear. I can't hear you. You know, I'm using my ears. Tell me, just go ahead. We are hearing you. Okay. Um. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can see. But yes, we can see. Okay, uh, my topic is the let's uh, insist is those uh, properties of mean seed extract. It is just a review paper. Uh, my co authors are Professor Maria Mwangi and Professor Liu. Uh, this is my presentation outline. Uh, the neem tree, uh, it belongs to the Meliaceae family, and uh, the main uh, active ingredient in neem oil or the neem seed extract is the uh, uh, azadiractin and it controls insect pests by different methods that is causing the antifibrant effect, uh, 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 suppressing reproduction, also blocking uh, sugar receptors and negatively affecting uh, metamorphosis of these insect pests. Uh, there are some factors affecting the efficacy of the uh, azadilactin or uh, the neem oil. One is the method and time of application, uh, method of extraction, consideration applied uh, insect uh, spice, uh, species, uh, origin of the neem tree, uh, temperature, and. Elvis, Elvis kind of, your, your slides are not moving, so go to presentation mode. Slide show and then. Share. On my end, on my end, they are moving. Oh. Um, okay, proceed. Can you see whether they are moving now? Yeah. Are they moving? Yeah. Okay. Uh, statement of the problem is the problems which come with the intensive uh, use of the insecticide is the resistant development by the pest, chemical residue in the agricultural produce, and effects on non target uh, insects, for example, the beneficial insects. Uh, information on the use of and efficacy of neem is scattered all over, but you find that uh, we cannot. Uh, consolidate the achievements which have been made on the same topic and also highlighting the remaining knowledge gaps is becoming a challenge. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, this review paper will be appreciating the, the efficacy of neem oil or as a drug thing, and it will be uh, enhancing the adoption by, by many farmers and which will help uh, in curbing the problems associated with the uh, uh, intensive uh, insecticide uh, pesticide use on crops and also uh, in boosting afforestation. Uh, knowledge gaps will also be highlighted in this review paper. So modes of action of this as a, uh, as a direct team, uh, there are two, the, the uh, systemic control and uh, uh, contact control. Uh, by systemic, uh, you find that as a direct team moves uh, systemically to all parts of the plants and then inhib uh, and hence inhibiting uh, settling behavior of this pest. Uh, but you find that as a deducting uh, is becoming um, uh, insoluble, uh, but it's because it is becoming less systemic because of the insoluble nature of uh, neem oil. And then uh, the contact control mechanism, uh, you find that as a deducting exhibits uh, translaminar activity. Uh, as a mode of action. Uh, the neem oil forms a coating uh, on the bodies of these insects, and this um, uh, leads to the sarcophagation and the, the death of these uh, insects. Uh, in our research, uh, the PF feeds we are deterred to land and probe or, 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 or deposit on the plants which were treated with neem seed oil. Uh, also, guise 
post more attacks on the panola plants, which were not uh, treated with the other drug team as compared to the treated crops. Um, now, uh, in the uh, the mode of uh, in the mode of, mode of uh, control, uh, it causes an uh, antifeedant uh, effect, and the the main uh, the main uh, uh, fragment which is responsible for this antifeedant effect of uh, the reaction is the hydroxyl um, fragment, and you find now that the members of um, Lepidoptera family they are uh, they uh, they a diffidence in this uh, family is achieved by very small concentration of uh, this other reactant that is 50 parts per million or less. But the, uh, the members of the Cleoptera, Hemiptera, and Homoptera, the diffidence is achieved by higher concentration of this meme oil that is between 100 and 600 parts per million. Uh, the females of Blanche, this is another pest, they exhibited less feeding when treated with meme uh, extracts than the males uh, of the blanche. Uh, also, the neem oil it reduces feeding and probing of the treated uh, uh, plants by the aphids uh, for around four uh, days after the spraying. And also locusts, uh, uh, which were treated with as a drafting, produce less fecal uh, pellets due to reduced feeding. And uh, you find that uh, the uh, less concentration of as a drafting, uh, it performed better uh, as compared to a higher uh, azactro concentration uh, in uh, controlling the feeding or in reducing the feeding of uh, southern amium moth. Uh, this is another method of the blockage of sugar receptors, which is so much connected to the adipendency effect of the azadiratin, where it is simulates the adherent cells of the receptors and blockage of the firing uh, sugar receptors. Uh, you find that in a research, in another research, as a reducing concentration of uh, 0.01 parts per million, uh, they prevented uh, desert locusts from feeding disc impregnated with sugar. Uh, and also, as a reducing uh, in the blockage of sugar receptors, also uh, prevents or reduces the chances of uh, disease uh, spreading where there was reducibility of peach potato aphid for, uh, to transmit uh, potato leaf uh, roll virus to tobacco plants, which were treated with this neem oil. And also another case study uh, reported reduced chances of green rice leaf opa to transmit to grow virus in, uh, in rice fields. Um, also, the other drug thing also causes uh, insect reproduction suppression, whereby it affects the development of ovaries, oogogenesis, egg, uh, egg availability, and also causes uh, reduced fecundity uh, and oviposition of these pests, uh, whereby adults uh, are killed by, the, uh, adults are also killed by disrupting the, male, uh, the mating and sexual communication, and hence reducing the fecundity whereby in a case study, the fecundity and of the position of Drosophila melanogaster uh, treated with a single uh, spray of neem oil were reduced and the number of eggs were also reduced. Uh, still on the same, uh, this signal, uh, the other reacting also significant, significantly increases aphid uh, in for mortality by 80%. Uh, and also reducing uh, that's increasing development time of those uh, nymphs which survived uh, later on. Uh, reduced sizes of the testes and the, the, the sperm amounts of desert locusts were uh, when treated with low concentration of azadiractin, and also there was affect uh, the, the azadiractin affected of the position of cabbage aphids in uh, treated plants by denying them favorite egg laying sites. Uh, also, it affects the other directing affects the insect metamorphosis, uh, whereby high concentrations of other directing uh, lead to inco uh, incomplete molting process. Uh, also, the you have, uh, the two, you have the two minutes to so kindly finish. Okay, the, uh, the pupation and the pupation. 
also film and blaster significantly with increase in the directing uh, concentration body weight of all the developmental stages of drosophila were also reduced by 10 to 20 percent uh, when treated uh, uh, as a directin. Uh, now, on the issues of face resistance against as a uh, and as a is not like any other uh, active ingredient of uh, synthetic pesticide. Is you find that there is red uh, uh, resistant development by this space to as a and this is the, the the main reason is that. Uh, the, uh, it prevents the pest from uh, produ producing this detoxification enzyme as a, process, uh, as a protein synthesis inhibitor. And uh, also as a routine also boosts the, the performance of biopesticide also by, by reducing their development of resistance against this biopesticide. Uh, my recommendation is that although the the, there's the less uh, uh, resistant development by space against azadiractin. Uh, uh, you find that uh, its its performance is far much below uh, synthetic, that of synthetic pesticide like abamectin and imidacloprid. So the main recommendation here is to try, or the knowledge gap is to try contain uh, azadiractin with other biopesticide and see if we can. Uh, raise its efficacy against insect pests. Uh, thank you so much for your time. That was my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ezekiel, for that wonderful presentation. We would like to ask you, as we are waiting for comments from other participants, yeah. if, if there are other alternatives which are better yeah, than the the one you are looking at. What motivated you now to look at it? Were you doing something like marketing for, for that? Because your conclusion is quite curious. Yeah? If you can go back to that conclusion. Can we go back to the last slide? Second last. Your recommendation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with the new reason now. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the main reason is that uh, this neem oil is a biopesticide. It is not like a synthetic pesticide. So you find it has so many benefits. You find that they, has, they, they are, are reduced or no uh, pest residues in the agricultural uh, produce. There is also no resistance of pests and uh, it does not affect other beneficial uh, uh, insects. For example, the adworms, which are beneficial to the farmer. So you find that although it is, uh, it has those benefits, you find the uh, that is its its pro its uh, uh, performance in insect insect control is far much below, let's say, fifty seven percent as compared to abamectin and imidacloprid, which is like eighty seven percent. So we want to look, uh, although we are controlling the pests, but you find out that uh, abamectin and imidacloprid they leave uh, uh, chemical residues to this uh, agricultural produce, which is not safe for human consumption. Thanks, I get you. Any other comment? Questions from participants? Reactions? And my speaker is not there. Let me put a chat. Okay. Ask whether it can be classified as a biopost How can it be classified as a you can ask on the yeah. How can this be classified as a pesticide? It a biopesticide? Okay, there is a question from Professor Muturi. She is asking, yes. how can you classify this? Is it a biopesticide or what? Yeah, it is a biopesticide. It is not a synthetic pesticide. 
be something from a plant, not a chemical. Are the, are the active ingredients, uh, uh, how biodegradable are they? Weapon. How biodegradable are the active ingredients? She's also asking how biodegradable are the, the, the active ingredients of the, of the pesticide. Yes, the active ingredient of this uh, neem oil is azadiratin, which is far much uh, biodegradable as compared to synthetic pesticide like imidacropid and uh, abamectin. And that's why we are saying that it leaves zero uh, chemical residues on our agricultural produce. So it is safe con for consumption as compared to these synthetic pesticides, which are bi non-biodegradable. Thanks for that presentation. Maybe it's because of uh, recommendation you did highlight on those benefits. So one might think that maybe you overlooked, but I think from your answers, you have the answers within you. So uh, incorporate those comments, yeah? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Let's have now the next presenter. Hed Korim. Hello, good, good evening. Good evening, sir. Introduce yourself, okay. where you come from, and move on. Okay, I'm Hezekiah Korir from the department of CHS, Pinkerton University. And so this, this is the, our presentation on a study we did on something about university-based strategies for driving application and uptake of grain legumes and dryland cereals, innovation by farmers. And we wanted to look at the student-led extension program. So I hope you are able to see my screen the shared screen. Proceed, please. We are seeing Okay, you. thank you. Okay, thank you. So I'm Ezekiel um, Korei, who is present, presenting on behalf of the other authors, that is Kipnge T. Shadrach, Professor Opio, and Professor Nancy Mungai, all from the CHS department. So as an introduction, we have the, this, the grain legumes and dryland cereal crops. And these crops are considered important when it comes to food security and also in terms of the nutrition security it can offer. And we know that now the issues of the climate change, most of these crops tend to struggle with the dry climate and all that. So because of research, we have ICRISAT coming in and other research organizations that have been able to do some advanced technology. And this is in, in terms of they have come up with better performing varieties and also some agronomic techniques that can be used to increase the yield of these crops and improve the livelihoods of the farmers in the dry lands. But now it comes to, we find that after this research institute have done the studies and they have good varieties, now there's that gap between now the technology of this flow from the research institutes to the farmers. So we find that the farmers don't know about what is happening and if there are any better approaches to their farming systems. And so we are able to look at, to try and see how can the universities play a role? Because you know that in the universities you have the agricultural programs, which train, we also have even here at Gaton, the research and extension division and all that. So this can be used to serve as a vehicle of transforming the rural population. And so we hypothesize that when we use students as extension agents, these students are able to identify the problems that the farmers face, and then they can get back to and inform the research organizations about the research needs that the farmers need. So for this study, we had three, three objectives. One is to train the students on the innovation that are available when it comes to grain legumes and dryland cereals. And for this, we did a selected crops, that's the cowpea, soya bean, and finger millet. Then number two, to use now these students to train the farmers on the innovations of these GLDCs. And then lastly, we also 
try to engage the students to assess the GLDC value chains in the selected counties where they were attached. So the methodology, how the study was organized. So we did student selection, and these were the students for the BSc, the third year, and the diploma, the second years, who are going on, on attachment. So we select, and then before they went on attachment, we did a pre-attachment pre training on these GLDCs. And then within now the farms, the students were able to set up demonstration plots within the farm. And now we wa wanted to test these two legumes, the cowpea and soybean, and one cereal, that is the finger millet with three different varieties to see how the farmers can be able to select and see how they perform. And then for soil amendments, we had DAP and uh, biofix, which, which is a biofertilizer for the legumes. And this was done in four counties, that is Nakuru, Baringo, Wasangishu, and Laikipia counties for the two months duration of the attachment. And then we used these students to do a survey on the GLDCs and did also a market survey on the availability of these seeds. Then at the end of the attachment, we also had a post-attachment evaluation with the farmers who were host for the students. So on the results, so first we looked at the training we gave to, to the students before they went on attachment. And we see that 75% of those students rated the training as very useful, while the 25 rated the training as useful when it came to their experience with the farmers. Then here we have some photos on some on-farm experiences that the students had. So on the left side on my screen, so these are soybean inoculated with the biofix. So within the farm also the student had a control plot with, with no addition of any soil amendment and the one that they used the farmer practice, the DAP, to be able to show the farmers how the biofertilizers work. And also apart from the GLDCs, the students also were able to do some other farming, help the farmers in other enterprises in the farm. For, for example, on my right, these are staking in garden peas that the students were able to help the farmers with. So the students did a survey on the neighboring farms. Each student took five farmers around the host farmer and tried to see which are the crops that the farmers were planting. And it came out that most of the farmers, 69% of the farmers were growing beans, followed by sorghum as a cereal. And then the other crops that were being done in large amount by, by many farmers, sorry, were the finger millet, cowpea, and sorghum within the neighboring farms. So the other crops were very less than 20% of the farmers were cropping those crops. So when we, we now narrow down to these three crops that we were interested in, the selected legumes, the cowpea, finger millet, and soybean. So we wanted now to, to see these host farmers that were hosting the students were they planting these crops. So we found that 36% of the farmers were planting cowpea, 18% of them were doing finger millet, but now none of these farmers was doing soybean within their farms. So we also sought to look at where do the farmers get their primary source of information on agriculture. So from the survey that the student did and the, from the analysis of those data, we found that most of the farmers say that they get them from agricultural organization like Caldro, KFIS, and others. Also, 72% also say that there are extension officers who came to visit them. <laughs> and then we also talked about now some of the neighboring farms had students being attached on their farm in the previous years. So 36% of them say that at least they, they had students that were on attachment and they were able to give them advice. And then we wanted to look at what are the challenges that the farmers face when growing this selected GLDC. So in terms of cowpea, what came out is that when farmers go to the market, they lack the cowpea seeds. So they don't know which seeds to buy. 
which is suited for their area. And some farmers in Laikipi and other areas, they, they say that most of the, during the cold season, the cowpeas is attacked by frost. Then when it came to soybean, the same, there was poor access to seeds. Some farmers in Baringo, though the dry areas say that they had poor germination. And then what came out when in soybean that made farmers not to plant is the issues of utilization. So most of the farmers don't know how to utilize soybean. And now, because of the utilization, they don't know how to oh. use it. Now the issues of marketability also came in. So they don't know when they harvest the soybean, where will they sell the, so the soybean? And on finger millet, most of the farmers say that finger millet is labor intensive because of the small seed dead and also the narrow spacing. So when it came to weeding, it was a tedious for them. So most of them tend to leave out the finger millet. And also when it came to post harvest handling, most of them say that during threshing, it's a, a lot of work and maybe it might lead to losses. So on the market survey on, of the seeds, so for example, on, on the right, on, on my left. You are telling me an offer. Okay, let me finalize. Okay, okay. So 48% of the stockists in, in the market sold, Cowpea. And on the right, these are some of the varieties that are available. So most of the farmers, around 38%, sorry, the, the stockists, 38% of them sold only the local varieties, which mostly are low yielding. Now, for soybean, only 9% of the outlet sold soybean. And when it came to finger millet, only 35% of them sold finger millet as seed. And then lastly, so we also sought to look at these outlets. Most of the outlets, 79% of them were stocking common bean and selling them to the farmers. So in conclusion, we saw that it, the prior academic training before the students go on attachment is good to have that training before they go out, especially on the technical issues. And now, the second point is that most farmers in the dry areas and other areas in Kenya, they mostly grow the common bean, cow peas, some of them, soybean, sorghum, and finger millet, at least in small amounts. And now the low uptake of the selected GLDC is because of there's no seeds in, in the market and also there's no in, information about how to utilize them. And then lastly, attaching the students on farm that will now enhance the linkage between the university and the farmers, because from the post-attachment meeting, the farmers are able to see an improvement in Hello. Sorry, we lost you, but we are back. There's some internet problems, connectivity problems okay. in the room. But we are back now. Are you through, Mr. Ezekiel? Yes, 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 I'm through, thanks. Thank you so much. Now the floor is open for participants to ask questions. You can uh, do it on the chat, but you can also raise your hand so that I can see you and give you an opportunity. Let me ask. Maybe the open equation to the presenter. Okay. You say you are using our students to transfer knowledge to the farmers, yeah? Yes. Before you sent out our students, did you measure their levels of uptake so that it could also be at, because you can send out people who have not taken all that information the same way. So how did you measure their levels of uptake before they go to the field? That's one question. The next one, when, uh, for how long did the students stay with the farmers? 
was that a contributory factor or maybe the period in which they stayed with them was enough? Maybe those are my few questions that I could think of as we are waiting for others to. Okay. Yeah. There is another one from uh, Professor Muturi. She's asking, now that farmers had challenges, were they able to apply the knowledge that the students disseminated? Maybe kind of respond to those three questions as you wait for other participants to. Okay, thank, thank you. So in terms of the period of attachment, so it does during, it was during the June, July period, mostly now when the, some of the farmers were still doing the preparation of the land. And these farmers had been informed earlier that the students would be attached on their farms. So they had already set up some areas aside for the student to do the demonstration. And the students stayed with, with the farmers for two months for the eight, eight weeks of the, of the attachment. And then we did some follow-up before the farmers came for the post-attachment meeting. So we invited all, mm. all the farmers that yeah, were involved in the university and we were able to get the feedback on how they viewed or how the students were able okay. to perform and what they got. And in terms of the you level of uptake, so just they, during they, before they, they went for the attachment. Where they got, you see where, where there is brooks. Okay, so before they went for attachment, we just did, did that training on the technical issues involving these crops. So we were able to, to measure the, the level of uptake by getting the feedback from the farmers after the attachment. And from Professor Muturi's question, so yes, these farmers during the post attachment meeting, so most of the farmers say that they were able, now even when the students were back during the short season, they were able to put in practice and most of them again now were willing to practice what the students had been able to show them in their farms. Thank you. The floor is still open for comments, contributions from participants. Thanks. If there's no question, then we move to the next presenter. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Ezekiel. Okay. The next presenter is N. Nyakapene, an analysis of entrepreneurial intent among rural youths in Njora sub county, Kenya. Is the presenter with us, please? Yes, I, I, I'm here, Prof. Kindly. Go on. Proceed. All right. Yeah, I, I, allow me to, to, to share. Allowed, please. Let me see. It's my first time. So you're starting at 3.50. We expect you to be through by four. All right. It seems my machine is sticking. Give us some time. We can see whether we can assist you from this end. Okay, okay. Uh, 
Could you kindly send the presentation to Mugambi at ikaton.vc.a? I'm sending you on chat. Is it possible for you to send us that presentation through the email that we have shared with you, Mr. Nyakapene? Yes, I can, I can, I can, I can, I can send. Kindly send it quickly then so that we can see whether we can help you from this end. Oh, thank you. You have seen the email? Yes, yes. Kindly share. Stop your share also. Stop sharing. Is it can Yeah, I, I have shared the, 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 the presentation.
Hello. Hello. Yes. Yeah, I, I have shared the, the 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 presentation to you. No, we are not seeing it. Yes. On, on the email. And the way you have shared is that's not how we share. You have to open the document first. Double click on that in the document, that PowerPoint. All right, all right. Yeah, I, I, I put the, the document, the PowerPoint on the email you shared with me. No. Have you seen the email? All right. It's not here, I I'm not seeing the email. I'm not getting the present. This is ready. Stop sharing. All right, all right. Have you stopped sharing? Yeah, I have stopped. Have you shared your presentation with the secretary earlier? Yes, yes, yes. I, I shared yesterday, even now I, 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 I emailed again. But who are they? So now we cannot still, we have not received it and we cannot trace the one you sent. Suggest is that you proceed presenting orally as we are looking for the, the slides. Yeah. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Yeah. Kindly read for us, I mean, to us, and then. You can just remove your screen. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Kindly stop sharing the screen so that we can be able to. Go yeah. Ahead, go ahead. Right. Good afternoon. So Just proceed. Yeah. Yeah. My 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 presentation is on uh, an analysis of entrepreneurial intent among the rural youths in 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 Joro sub count. Um. Out of 1.2 billion people in Africa, uh, about 55 about 50 percent are aged below 35 years. As per se, 15 to 35 years in Africa, um, Africa currently is facing the problem of high unemployment among the youths, and the situation correlates with the Kenyan environment, approximately of above 70 75 percent. Are the youths. Public and private sectors mentioned entrepreneurship as the option to solve unemployment. Among others, access to credit may influence willingness of youths to become entrepreneurs, and entrepreneurial intention of youth is also a great concern because youths are still believing in government employment. In, in examining entrepreneurial interest, the idea is to encourage youth to be entrepreneurs, uh, causes of unemployment, lack of work experience. Uh, as you see in the, in the industry, most of the adverts, uh, they are requesting a five years work experience, whilst most of uh, the population, these are just uh, graduates who are, who are lacking that experience, skill mismatch and the regulation in the employment council. You can find out that in the employment council, the door is open for those who passed the examination, and there is no job which is just employing a person without 
uh, passing the examination. High cost of education and internet costs, Evans Pro in the high cost of land. You can find out that most of rural land is now absorbed by the urbanization and urban is expanding into rural areas to the extent of now there is land constrained even to encourage those youths to be in entrepreneurship made in the agricultural sector. Then poor infrastructure development, economic instability. Then impacts of uh, unemployment. We have the uh, psychological stressed up, early marriages, political instability, brain drain due to search of uh, green pastures, high crime rates. Then the entrepreneurship as the way to go. Uh, what is entrepreneurship? Is an opportunity obsessed, holistic in approach and leadership balance. You can't say you want to be an entrepreneurship while you still don't have uh, these uh, characteristics and you, you want, you can't be an entrepreneurship why you, you want to be. You want a leader or someone, you have to have leadership characteristics. Forces that can drive youth, youth to be entrepreneurship. We have push factors like poor payment, abuse at work, difficulties to find the job, then poor factors, independence, opportunity identification, personal develop, uh, development in the high wages. Then a proportion of youths willing to start a uh, business. You can find out that uh, in Joro, more than 7% of the youths uh, from selected words were willing to start a business and the results show that willing, we, results show that youths are willing to start a business in farming, selling second hand plot and value addition to agricultural produce. This is referenced by some of the students who are doing yogurt, a value, a milk value addition to yogurts, and some, if you go to the end in Jokeri and at, at the gate there, people, they are trying to sell Mutumba there, which is uh, a business which is booming in the youths. Then we have uh, motivating factors, variables like family assets, higher education level, higher education levels, training and experience, we're more likely uh, to motivate youths to start business. You can find out that to those who are already in business and entrepreneurship, some of them, they just uh, use the family assets to venture into entrepreneurship, but those who don't have family assets, they are still struggling. And those with knowledge and training of entrepreneurship are those who are interested. You can find out that those students who are not and youth who are not exposed to the entrepreneurship courses, they are not much more interested. They think that entrepreneurship is for those who do business studies. Then we go to challenges. Uh, according to Friedman, test ranks, lack of capital and difficulties in accessing capital were the most uh, challenging factors which is facing the youth to become entrepreneurs. Then the possible recommendations, more research in entrepreneurship and unemployment, channeling of funds towards entrepreneurship regardless of education level, serious monitoring and follow-up, mandatory entrepreneurship unit or course to all university students so that when they go out of university after they finish, they, all of them, they will be in the same level of solving unemployment. Installation of entrepreneurship hubs in, in every county or university workshop and community programs for the same, introduction of ready seed capital to potential businesses. Uh, acknowledgement uh, to my supervisors, Professor Mtandwa and Pro Dr. Langat uh, Igaton University for including me in this conference and the TAGBIV office. I thank you. Thank you, Navison. I guess you have realized that we, we trust our paper and we share. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so let's have questions from uh, participants. There's any question? Any reaction to the presentation by Navison? Maybe out of some interest, you talked of entrepreneurial activities, yeah? 
which were the most popular amongst the students, I mean, the, the rural youths. You talked of clothes, yeah? Selling of second-hand clothes, yeah? But if you rank them. Yeah, if we rank, we will find out that uh, uh, most youths, they are now diverting uh, from, they are now they are now diverting from 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 agriculture. Now yeah. they want to venture into selling like this uh, second hand clothes and the value addition of uh, of uh, agricultural produce. Yes, they are not like interested in the in the production side. Okay. Is there any variations amongst the students? Gender variations, yeah. Not students, but youths, yeah. Who are going for yes. value addition? Yeah, maybe you can talk about that. Sorry, come again. I was asking if if you disaggregate your data along gender between males and females, yeah, who are yes. more uh, gravitating towards agriculture, second hand clothes, and uh, value addition of agricultural products, yeah. That yeah, mostly the, the, the bigger percentage was men. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Was men, uh, youths, uh, I like women, they were mostly interested in, in a thing like uh, saloons, but uh, men were the most who were, who were interested in uh, these activities. Ladies, uh, to a lesser extent. You can ask if there are any other questions for me that they can join the you tell them how to join. Okay, so. so you want us to go back to the main meeting now. Uh, the procedure for going back to the main meeting. You click on the right hand side. That is Room. Click on the leave room, then link the breakout room. Don't leave the meeting. Link the breakout room so that now you can buy on the main. Yes, then you do have a poll there. Yes. Thank you. You can now start moving to the to the main meeting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the presentations. What we are saying is that we have come to the end of the presentations. You can join the others. You can join the others, but you go to the right hand of the screen, leave room. Then after that, leave breakout room. Then they can join other sessions. Yes, ongoing. Yeah. Thank you. Just ongoing. There, there are ongoing sessions which you can join as you wait for the other breakout rooms to change.